Hello. Thank Hello. you all. Hi. Jumping on office hours. Look at everybody. Hello. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So um, I some of you were on our call this morning in the fund manager uh, office hours where we introduced um, what we are going to, as a BI team, be focusing on for the next two weeks in our office hours, which is the impact of fiscal year on the reporting out of the general ledger as it relates to fin units and projects and um, specifically the impact on that equity allocation account the three zero 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 I'm not sure how many zeros are back there but it's got a lot of zeros behind it so um, we're going to continue that conversation. For those of you who were not on this morning's call, welcome, welcome. Uh, you didn't miss anything. There will be some repeating of that. Uh, repetition is always good as we start to kind of dive into the things that are happening. Um, but uh, just to give you a little bit of context, we know that based on the closeout activities in the general ledger, um, there are going to be some changes to values. These are expected changes. They are happening according to the design of the system. And um, those changes will be um, there to support moving into the new fiscal year. We have to start thinking about from a reporting perspective, um, the fundamental question that I think we all ask on a daily, if not more than once a day basis of our reporting as fund managers, which is um, how much money does my faculty have? Uh, how much money do we have? How's the money doing, right? It's all about this kind of getting to that number. And it's one of the common and focused questions that we have in the reporting solutions that we're working on, that we're streamlining, that we're evolving. Um, to support those efforts, the CBO team, um, along with the design of the system, created this managerial reporting hierarchy. And some of you might remember from our earlier office hours, we had Kathy Sweet from CBO come and train us on what that managerial reporting hierarchy was, that it was kind of an expanded version of what you might have known in the older system as your sub accounts and the, the tracking of information um, a little more in line with what the older system um, did for you. And this particular reporting hierarchy starts with the equity allocation account, that 3000000 account, and then continues keeping track of all of what we call your profit and loss type accounts. Those are your expenses and your revenue. And that includes those 7,000 series accounts that you use for your transferring of money, right, within the resources in, expenses out. For some of you, that general ledger information is mission critical to being able to get to the, to the answer of how much money does my faculty have to spend? How much money do we have available for a project, for a FIN unit, right, within the organization? In July, the start of the brand new fiscal year, as expected, the revenue and the expenses for your projects and FIN units will reset to zero because they're being tracked fiscal year by fiscal year. And the activity for that fiscal year will need to be reallocated to you in that 300 account so that the equity allocation at the beginning of July is the result of what you started with last year and what you spent or got in last year, right? Just doing some math of that. Where we come into uh, the conversation is that the reallocation of that money for your project and your FIN unit is not going to happen until fiscal year closeout at the UCOP level. And last night, um, we caught wind that that's going to be in the October timeframe. So what that means for my team is that we have some gaps to fill. 
um, from July 1st through whenever this happens, we need to help you get to that answer. How much money do we have to spend? And the reports that we have built work great as long as that allocation account is updated, but we've got a gap between when the year ends and when the allocation is going to hit. Um, so part of what we're going to be looking at is how to understand, first of all, what's happening. And um, I asked Kirsten Sykes to join us on this call. She's been a part of the allocation um, project and communication and testing from the beginning. This morning, some of you had some accounting questions and I did the best I could, but I told you we're having an expert on the call. We now have the expert on the call. So let's bring those questions up again to really understand what's going to happen. I want to take a look at some data in production that's going to help us communicate what's going on. Sometimes a visual is, is helpful. Um, and then as part of this, really compiling a list of some of the tools that are the most useful to you right now in answering that question. Um, my team is not going to be able to rebuild every report in the next week. It's not going to happen, but we, we know that we need to help you and partner with you on this. And so part of this conversation, what I would like to get out of it is, what are the things that are most useful now that we can augment to help you as this moves forward and to give you the tools to just set you up for as much success as possible? Um, any questions about that kind of summary overview, what's happening, what's led to this kind of two-part conversation on the reporting side from Oracle? So let me, before we jump into questions, let me just jump in real quick. For those yes, of you, please, Kirsten. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Kirsten Seitz. I am the um, foundation controller and the, lead, the head of gift and foundation accounting. Um, but I have been involved in the design of the Oracle project from the beginning. Um, Melissa Navarro from uh, Internal Controls and Accounting, and I have worked very closely with um, the lead from the Med Center uh, to, de to develop the entire GL uh, configuration and structure. So I'm very well versed in that. Melissa was not able to join us today, so I said that I would be here in her stead. Um, one thing I want to clarify about the closeout to net position. Oracle automatically will process this closeout on July 1st, where all of the revenue and equity will close out to that net position number, but only at the entity and fund segments, because those are our two balancing segments, as you are probably all aware. Um, what Beverly was talking about related to the allocation is um, we've developed an allocation process that will take um, the activity in fiscal year 21 and reallocate that down that close out to just the entity and fund down to the entity fund financial unit and project so that when you run your project level reports those beginning balances are updated um, as we were going through and de designing the allocation process we discovered that we can only run this once um, oracle does not does not work well when we try to run it multiple times um, so we have to wait until the audit is finished, which is sometime in October. Um, we've, I, I think we were told mid-October. I know there's a state um, certification deadline that OP has. Um, so that, that's kind of where we're at, why we are, where we are at and why we're talking about this. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Kristen, Kristen? Yes, yes. hi, Grace. Uh, hi, I just want to make sure I heard this correctly. You said July 1st. The general ledger will close at entity and fund segment. Yes. So if you're, and, if you're uh -huh. so if you're just looking at entity fund, the um, when July gets opened uh -huh. in a few days, um, the revenue and expense on that fund will close out to net position on that fund, regardless of project. It'll strip off financial unit. It'll strip off project. Then once we've got confirmation that the audit is finalized, we will run this allocation process to take that change that was posted to net position on the fund and push it out to the financial unit and the project that it originally came from on June 30th. Which would be not till October, you said. Right. Okay. But June 30th, if I want to look back to my 2021, everything should be fine in there. 
Yes. Whatever we, however we closed. Yes. Okay. So this is all affecting only the carry forward kind of, if you think about it. Yes. But what about any transactions we do in the new fiscal year starting July 1st? Will it hit, will it still be a normal business with project tasks and everything, you know, hitting July, August, September? Ledgers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And so for us, we have built quite a few of these project based and fin unit based general ledger, like help us with the math reports to start with the value of the carry forward and then do the math based on the activity. And from July 1st to the October timeframe, that carry forward number will not be accurate because it will not reflect that new allocation. So this is the this is the gap that we're trying to fill and and give solutions for um knowing that uh we are going to have to be thinking about this. Right, um, but moving but, forward, right? This is not just about this fiscal year. This is an ongoing and, right. um challenge that and we're going to be facing. Yeah, and I will add like this is how every accounting system works. The 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 p &L, the revenues and expenses, all of that activity closes out to equity at the end of every year and you start over fresh. And so when you run reports on fiscal 21, the data will be as it is today. Nothing will change on fiscal 21. Um, what, is, what will happen is when you run a July ledger, your revenue and expense accounts will start at zero. And the, and, and the net position number will update. Right. My question is this, though, the end, I mean, June 30th is, is the carry forward, you know, whatever balance is there is also our carry. I mean, we can look at that yep. to see what the carry forward is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The other so question I have is what account you will use for the carry forward? 300,000? Not zero, I hope. Well, I think, I think, so we're trying to figure out, and part of why Beverly's bringing this up is we're trying to figure out a reporting solution so that you're not having to wait until October to have a good cash balance. Um, I think while that's being, while those reports are very quickly being built, um, I think you could also run your balances at, through June 30th wow. and then run your July, August, September, October activity and add the right, you know, add that net change on your p and on the revenue and expense right. to your carry forward balance. Mm -hmm. um, we're just trying to figure out a way to systemically do this so you're not all having to manually update your beginning totals. And when you say manually update, where would that have to take place? It, I'm, I'm assuming that would be manual. It was mentioned in the 9 a.m. that it would uh, probably be a good idea to download all your balances at June closing in Excel and take it from there. It, essentially, yeah. Run, run your June totals and update your carry forward total at that project level. And then add, add the new fiscal year activity to it. Oh, but all via Excel. Yeah. We're trying to find a non-Excel solution. But I think, you know, Beverly was trying to get to a what's an alternative option while that non Excel solutions being built and tested. Right. I think, you know, the reality is that we do not want to make you have to do that. That is a lot of work. It's a lot of manual. And anytime you move financials into manual, there's the risk of error, mistake, human audit capability of getting back to the source. However, the last thing I want to do is have you guys come into the system after this beautiful long holiday weekend, log in, see a bunch of zeros and start panicking, right? So I want to just set everyone up for as much success as possible, giving you worst case scenario, ways that you can augment your tools as we start to think about what can we have available to you on 7-1. And what can we start to look at over the next couple of weeks, knowing that, you know, of the 900 and some odd reporting objects, not all of them will be impacted, but we also can't rebuild all of them, right, in that short amount of time. So 
the end result of this is to find the way to handle this long term. Um, I also want to make sure no one is surprised, right? And really just start this communication. And I think um, someone brought up a very good point on the, in this morning's call, which was also communication out to the faculty level and communication out to um, additional communities. And I'm working with Laura and the communications um, on that. So, so um, there's been a couple questions in the chat on, do we have to run the reports for June if the data will stay? My thought would be no, you could run the, you could run June whenever you need to look at it. Um, but I think when we get to mid August, when the campus really stops transacting and sends the data up to OP for their audit, um, at that point, the balances for the most part will be pretty stable, barring any audit adjustments that come down from OP. Um, I think the thought is if you, if you run it and download it, you don't have to keep running it each time you want to look at a balance. You could just have a balance starting point and then drop in new data. At, at least for me, that's how I would probably do it because I don't like to redo work if I don't have to. Um, <laughs> and I know we're all so busy. Um, just trying to think of, of ways to be efficient. So Kirsten, um, I think I'm going to share my screen. Can we just kind of talk through that project that you and I were looking at? Um, just to just to kind of augment, I know this morning it was a lot of conversation and questions. Um, I'd like to really look at some of the reports that we have out of prod on the current um, fiscal year information so that we can start to see the numbers and the aligning of those numbers um, so that we can just kind of wrap our heads more around this. Kirsten and I looked at a sample project. I, I don't know whose project this is. I just picked a random number out of Chem and Biochem. So, um, if one of you own this project, I apologize for not asking permission. I just went after a random data set, but it seemed to make the math make sense. And it really solidified it in my mind as well in terms of what we need to be looking at um, moving forward. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Kirsten, do you think we should start at the general ledger level? Um, mm, maybe project level. Yeah. Okay. So what I have on my screen out of production um, is on the project panorama that's been on reports.ucsd.edu for several months. There's a general ledger project balances. Now I saw a lot of questions coming through the chat about PPM. Remember that these reports to the left are out of PPM. PPM is inception to date and is not impacted by the fiscal year. So if you never use these reports, um, this information will look as expected. It carries over the fiscal year. It's about the life of the project, the life of the award. This is truly focused on general ledger information with the project segment being populated. So I ran this particular um, project balance for June 21, which is the current month for this project that I randomly selected out of a list of projects to see the beginning net position. This is that 300,000 account, that 300,000 account. This is the fiscal year 21, July 1 carry forward. This is your total resources coming in based on where the account falls in the managerial hierarchy. This is your year to date money out based on where your account falls in the managerial hierarchy. This column is the math between the two. So you can see negative 24, eight plus 328 minus 53 gets you to this ending net position. There's your capital equipment amount. That is an asset account. That asset account is pulled out of the primary hierarchy. This is the big augmentation enhancement that we released a couple of weeks ago. And then the math between your ending net position and your capital equipment gives you your resources available. Hopefully this layout, this visual is familiar at some level to most of you on this call. It's been out and a part of, obviously we've done some augmentation on it, but this has kind of been one of the ways that we have visualized how to get to how much money can I spend? So with what we were talking about a few minutes ago, 
come July 1, the beginning net position, if you run this project, will continue to be this negative 24,860. The total resources and total expenses on July 1st will be zero. And the ending net position will be negative 24,860. The change between the 328 and the 53 will have been posted to, in this case, fund 13,991 at the entity level. And the allocation back down to update this beginning net position value is what will not occur until October. So and Kirsten, the, the 300,000 account will not get cleared out at July 1st. It's just the revenue and expenses. Correct, because the 300,000 account net position is actually part of the balance sheet. So it will stay for all of time until all of the money in that fund has been spent. Um, so once the allocation is done in October, the beginning net position for this project will be this 254.18.20. Kirsten, this is Jamie. Yep. Hi, Jamie. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. So question on the capital equipment. What, yep. what is driving that, um, that number? Are you using an expense account or? No, it's an asset account. Oh, so what they cleared out. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's, it's the asset account. Got it. So it's okay. only the asset account. Yeah, so the managerial hierarchy, as Beverly mentioned, only it includes the net position account and all of the profit and loss, all of the re revenues and expenses. Um, because capital is an asset, um, in order to make this math work, we had to pull that asset account in, in a separate column. Because when you spend money for capital equipment, you've reduced your cash and you've increased your capital equipment asset, your overall net position isn't going to change as a result of that purchase of equipment. So if we're trying to get to what is your resources available um, without looking at the inner fund cash on a project, you have to look at, you have to do this math. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Beginning net position, yes, Kimberly. So. The beginning net position, as we're seeing right now, this is June, 2021, and we've got 24, 860, 96. On July 1st, because that equity closeout is only going to post at the fund and entity level, it will not post to this financial unit, it will not post to this project. If you run this report on July 1st, that beginning net position is gonna be exactly the same as it is today. Your resources and expenses are going to be zero. The ending net position, because this is using math, is going to be the negative 24,000. When the allocation occurs in October, that ending net position number that we're seeing here currently of the 250,000 will become the beginning net position number. If you were to go back and run July 1st, um, the entry will post into fiscal 21, but it will not post until October. If you were to run July, a July report after that allocation has run in October or any month in fiscal year 22 for that matter, the beginning net position will then be 250,000. And what happens to the capital equipment? So because that's a balance sheet account, unless you've purchased more equipment, that number will stay static. So then the capital equipment would stay there the beginning balance would be the 250 for 18. The capital equipment would stay there so we can get a, a balance, you know? Correct. Okay, cool. But yeah. um, so then the beginning net position here is actually as of 7120. I thought you said 21 earlier. 21. I, I mean, I use this report a lot, but um, just wanted to clarify. Yeah, no. So for, uh, because this is run as of June 2021. Right. The beginning oh. that position is as of June 2020. Right. That's true. That's true. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and then my question I asked earlier real quick. Um, so the carry forward from this year to next year that it's going to happen in um, October, it's going to be also under 300,000, account 300,000. Correct. So and in October, become, this report okay. will be back to working right, as but, intended. Right, but are you going to allocate them at the project, as you said, not to zero, 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 project zero, zero, zero? It will be okay. allocated back to the financial unit and project that you see here on the screen at this point. 
Okay, great. Thank you. And Kirsten, I think you said this, but if say we're running this report in November and looking at it for a counting period of July, yep. that beginning net position will include the carry forward. Correct. Okay. Um, Luke, which accounts are included under capital equipment? Um, I believe they just picked any capitalized assets. It's the one, oh, Heather, one six zero 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 B and below. Actually, from uh, the hierarchy. A. Beverly, I think this, I sent you a quick chat. I think this is still pulling the original plan, one five zero 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 A. Okay, so we don't have that enhancement oh, yet. We, we need to change it because that's including too many things. And Luke made a comment about that in the chat. Yes. Okay, um, I will double check. That. We have to make a change there. So yeah, that, we might. That is it a might still be in the migration queue. Yeah. Um, and I can actually, I have this pulled up from a general ledger perspective as well. Um, do you love my lovely annotations there? Uh, but let me just click over here. Um, see if I can clear those annotations out of there so that they're not in our way. Um, so this is, oh, how do I stop doing that? There we go, shut that down. Okay, um, so this is the pull of the general ledger transaction details for that FIN unit for that project code so that you can see where those numbers are coming from. So this particular um, account is the 163003 account, which would still pull, I believe, under the 16,000B mm -hmm. parent. Also, it does not include accumulated depreciation. What's being pulled into that report that we were just looking at excludes accumulated depreciation. So that shouldn't affect the resource calculation. Um, Lindsay, you asked, how are you locking down the entity fund FINU project chart string? Um, what do you mean by that? Like not crossing, looking to a project on the wrong financial unit? Yep. So Oracle only really has one mechanism to lock this down in the GL and it's called cross-validation rules. Cross-validation rules are incredibly cumbersome to maintain. Um, so we cannot lock that down with the way they, with, with the way Oracle function is allowed to function at this point in time, not anything we designed, just how Oracle works. Um, because we add projects so frequently, um, we would be constantly maintaining cross-validation rules and no one would get any work done, unfortunately. Um, yeah. we, we do have financial unit and entity locked down um, because we were able to, you know, using hierarchies, build that. Um, but because project numbers are randomly assigned, um, there's, there, it would not, there's no easy way to control that. Okay. Sorry. No, I know. It's just like... I know. Yeah. I get, In accounting I, land, this is like a nightmare. <laughs> you no, know, I, I believe me. I know my team gets plenty of tickets asking us to fix stuff. Um, so yes, is that something that we should all be cognizant of and trying to fix, act, yeah. like actively yeah. throughout the, our life cycle in OFC? Absolutely. And if okay. and the best way to do it is to, you know, I think things coming through from the subledgers shouldn't have that problem because the poet should drive that, but making sure that the chart strings provided to accounts payable or to AR, um, or when any, like, you know, when we, we run into this with requests from the foundation, um, we've been given a project and a financial unit that don't actually match. And we try to validate it, um, you know, when it's one of our steps, but because it's a human thing, um, yeah, definitely try to make sure that the data that you provide is as accurate as possible. And if you come across it, um, you know, prepare the appropriate cost transfer, resource transfer uh, to correct it. Yeah. 
What other questions do you all have? Lots of questions. Uh, in this morning's call, it was mentioned that there was going to be, and maybe you already posted, so apologies if you have a list of reports that would um, be the best tools to use during this gap time. So I don't know. Yes. If already created. It's not, it hasn't been created yet. Um, I do have the comprehensive list of everything that my team has identified as being impacted by this. Um, by Monday, I will have a list of what we are going to be able to augment to get you through this time period. Um, and in next week's office hours, I plan to demo several of them um, and give you guys an opportunity to, to see them, touch them, all of those things. Um, knowing that we may have deemed one unimportant that happens to be important, but this is my recommendation. If you guys know for sure I use this one and it's on the managerial hierarchy, get it my way so that I know for sure that it's on our list. But we'll try to have that list posted um, for you Monday. I think Monday's a holiday for you guys, so Tuesday. And then on the office hours next week, I'll have actual like live reports to show you. Um, most likely we will create just a separate area for those to live so that it's a really easy thing to find and use and work with as we try to figure out the bigger picture. Um, this is going to be just kind of an ongoing teaming of my team and this team as we try to make sure that we're supporting you guys as best as possible. So I've got a couple of possible solutions that might um, make this easier on all of us. Um, it's just going to be some time this weekend to try to get some of that put together. So expect a list no later than next Tuesday and then some demos of those reports on the Wednesday office hours. Okay. Because I'm already thinking as a division, all of our divisions are going to have to do closing reports for our dean's offices. And in our case, um, academic affairs would be our EDC's office. Plus they're going to expect quarterly reports. So if it's not going to, if um, we aren't going to get updated information until October. It's going to delay our quarterly reports that much longer. Just so you know, the impact <laughs> and and a thousand percent, Patty. And I think this is why um, you know I reached out to uh, Marissa about the fund manager training or office hours this morning. Of like, we just need to start this conversation because I I agree that the impact um, is even bigger than I'm anticipating it to be. Um, which is why, you know, this kind of feedback from you is so critical to us partnering and helping, right. In terms of realizing that this isn't just a couple of weeks, this is multiple months of the equity allocation not happening. Yeah. Um, and I, we, we, we need to try to fill that, that gap, um, as as much as we can to get you guys through that because I think quarterly reports are going to be impacted um start of year reports are going to be impacted it's there's there's quite a bit coming so and and there was mentioned this morning pardon any redundancy um we received the notice yesterday that many of the um ticket the tickets that were submitted to do adjustments were not going to be able to be processed for June close so that's another thing that we're going to have to contend with, with manual adjustments on the reports. Because, you know, our dean's offices are asking us, how much cash do we have? How much cash do we have? Always. Yep. Can we hire somebody? Can we not hire somebody? Um, so, and with that comes along the EBC's office and the vice chancellor of resource management, as you know. So um, just trying to think about all that as we're going through this process right now. We'll see what you come out with Tuesday, which I appreciate. And I know that's going to be hearing you guys out for the weekend. Um, apologies, but um, it'll, it'll really help when we have those discussions with our dean's office and our VC's offices. So appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And we're happy to do it. You know, this was something that we anticipated there being some fiscal year end gaps um, and just recently realized, oh, there's a fiscal year start gap that we need to also think about with these. And so we're, we're happy to dive in and, um, and support as needed. Um, and thank you to all of you, um, for, you know, sending those emails, just ping me on teams, throw them in an email to me. We're just trying to create a comprehensive list of everything you're using now. Um, I also want to caveat this with my focus and my team's focus is going to be on the reports that are coming directly out of Oracle. 
So if you are using an activity hub report, a Cognos report, a Tableau report, I don't have any control or visibility to that work. Um, and I know that that is uh, a part of what you guys also use to augment your reporting solutions. So we're we're dedicated and focused into trying to get these source reporting um, solutions in place for you. But it we are focusing on the Oracle panoramas that are coming out of the OFC system. So I just want to make sure that we have that out there as well. Um, for those of you who might have a Cognos report that you think would be impacted, I think the best um, recommendation would be to try to to reach out to the author of that and and talk through if there's any plans on anything coming on that side. And those are the things that we'll need to adjust because we use the Oracle reports as our basis to start with. So we're looking at the NOR, making sure that we're balancing to that and what adjustments need, need to be made there okay. um, and make the adjustments that we need to um, utilizing Cognos and activity up reports. So we sort of use it all because we have to. <laughs> so it, it's just a delay I'm concerned about, but you know, we all have the same concerns. So we all want to know what cash we have, right? Yeah. Right. And I think the good news is that it's we can get to it, right? It's not like the data's clearing out. It's not like the data's right. going it's, somewhere. Yeah. It's just the extra time right now. Yep. We just need to get to it and get the math going and, and have some eyes on these reports to, to check our numbers and to check our math as always, right. Making sure we're validating all of that. Um, so that's the good news that, that we have the data. It's just a matter of rethinking the presentation of it to keep you guys from going into this kind of manual plus and minus profit loss, Excel spreadsheet manipulation of your data. Right. Yeah. And I do want to share, um, this, there's this other tab on the project panorama called gift fund balances, and it really actually is a cash balance across both ledgers. Um, it is not locked down to gift funds. It will show just that inner fund cash account balance down to the FINU and project number. So I'm going to pop over here real quick just to remember we had this 171 here with all this math. When I run this for the same project, it's the same balance. Now, what this does not take into consideration is any um, revenue that's been recognized on AR not yet received or expenses that have been incurred where the payable has not yet been cleared. So it won't reflect that, but this is the actual inner fund cash balance on a fund and FINU and project. And this will continue to function on July 1st. So this could be a tool in your quiver um, so to speak, as we go into the fiscal year as a play, as a starting place to get to actual cash, um, it just won't include any of those, you know, those things that have not yet affected cash. Why do you pull it under give fund balance? So I originally had this report built for the found, from the foundation perspective before STAR was, um, before star remediation had occurred, because we wanted to be able to provide balances across both ledgers. So if I were to pick a gift fund here, this would actually return a balance with um, from the foundation ledger as well. Um, and it adds the two together, similar to how, um, if you've been in, the, in advancement star system, um, you may be familiar with. When we built this though, we did not lock it down to gift funds. It, it actually works on all funds. Um, you can click in here. It is a concatenated fund value, concatenated financial unit. So you do have to click in and search, um, but it works quite well and it pulls back that cash balance. Um, someone have a gift fund they can think of off the top of their head? <laughs> We'll use the say out fund. You know, I always use say out. <laughs> always. It's just an easy, we'll easy honor, one to type in and remember. And there's a few of them. We'll honor Junior today. Um, yeah. And then what's great about this example is there's actually, oh, I need to drop this off also. There's actually um, activity on both ledgers. Um, So just wanted to share that as well. Um,
While that is running, can you see accurate balances for sponsored projects on this tab or no? Because I found that, that some of mine are, don't seem accurate. So I think the challenge with sponsored projects is that the revenue for the sponsored project is posted centrally. Um, it is not posted down to the project level. So when you go to run balances, it's going to be missing the revenue, which would mean the cal calculation of cash down to the project level um, that this report does would miss that piece. The revenue- Thank you. Yeah, the revenue is still in the fund. It just isn't going to be down to that project. So then that's where the PPM uh, reporting comes in, right? Because that gives you your full sponsored project revenue. Yeah, so we've, we've talked about potentially renaming this to just, just be cash balances on both ledgers um, because that's really what it is. This is data pulling directly from the foundation ledger. You see there's no project information because the foundation ledger does not use project. Um, the endowment corpus shows here, the expendable balance for the foundation shows here. And then this is the breakout of the expendable balances on these three SEAL funds by project and financial unit. And just to ask the dumb question, negative money means you actually have resources. No, and on this case, it's cash. So negative means you have a deficit. Oh, darn it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it gets me every time too, Lindsay. I'm like, oh, oh man, those can signage we make it flips. consistent at least? <laughs> those signage flips. They get me every time. Is, yeah, there, is just, there any is there any way that um, you know, re referencing the signage that it could be placed somewhere that a negative, you know, like some notation in your reports that a negative means that there's it's a balance or not a balance? Is that something that could just be noted on the reports? I think though though that I mean, most of the reports that are reporting balances, I think we pretty much standardized. We flipped the sign, so to speak. So if it's a balance and it's, um, especially if it says net position, if it's negative, it's, it's a deficit. If it's positive, it's positive. So I should always just assume that a negative means it's in the hole? Right, but what, what happens in Oracle is a, a uh, surplus and net position is, is really a credit balance and credits and oracles are by default are represented as a negative. Yep. So we have to, in reporting, we need what we call flip the sign to, um, to make sure that it, it's shown correctly. Um, and I think most of the reports that has been done. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm just, I shy away from using credits and debits, <laughs> you know, that term. Right. Uh, I just right. try to make it a little simpler just to say, okay, all I want to know is, do I have money there or don't I have money there? You know, the bottom line. And so that's, right. that's kind of what I'm getting, you know, what I always go to. So on any report, again, if it says ending net position or resources available, we have flipped the sign on those. So they are reporting. If it's positive, it's positive. If it's negative, it, it is negative. Yeah. If and it, on this one, it's just reporting cash, which... Right its natural balance is going to be a positive if it's a positive. Um, so there's no sign flippage needed here. Um, so yeah, this right here is actually a deficit. So then Kirsten on your previous, another tab, then mm -hmm. that report should be that beginning net position, that negative, is that actually a deficit? It is. Yes. It is. Okay. So this yep. one's okay. Okay. What other questions? Oh, so the permissions to that report that I just showed, um, anybody with all inquiry access should be able to, if you have GL inquiry and reporting, um, you should be able to see it. You do need to have access to the foundation ledger, but I believe um, something was recently pushed out where everybody with GL inquiry and access should have access to both ledgers. Um, so run that report, run it on a foundation gift fund, which is any fund that starts with A through L. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not seeing data come back and you have, um, I'll pull it back up just to point it out, and you have used the search with the concatenated name, um, if you're not seeing data, then you then it is potentially a, a, 
access issue and you can click here to request the access and I can usually get those approved pretty quickly. Oh. There's a couple things in the chat. Yeah, Karen, how are the AH people being brought into this discussion? What do you mean by AH? Activity I, hubs? The BI activity hubs. Because if there's going to be changes in, in uh, reporting over on the Oracle side, that's also going to be reflected on the activity side. And maybe they have different solutions. Um, so they don't know about it until you know somebody brings them in. And I'm not sure that there's anybody on these calls that are also working on the activity hubs. Sure, so the, the data going into the activity hubs is not impacted by any of this. The data is the data is the data, right? right. Um, it's really just an issue of, are there any reporting tweaks? And I, I believe the, the plan for reporting from the get-go was if you're reporting purely financial data, you should be getting that reporting out of Oracle. It's when you're doing blended reporting that the data from the activity hubs comes into play. Yeah, and and Karen, um, I you know I I do have a blinder focus, of course, on the Oracle BI solution and strategy, just due to my position. But I would be happy to send an email to just put this on the radar of whomever on the Activity Hub side of the house. I know sometimes there's so many things to think about that you're not thinking about potential things. Yep. Um, so if you want to throw in the chat the right resources, I'm not I'm not even sure at this point who I would reach out to, but I'd be happy to initiate that communication and just say, you know, the Oracle BI team noticed that this is going to be a gap and we're looking to address it. And it came up on the call that it might be nice to, you know, have you guys just aware of this if you aren't already. I'd be I'd be happy to facilitate that communication. OK, thank you, because um, I know you I know for you, you don't really care where the report's coming from. You just need to do your job. Right. right. And, you yeah. know, I can focus on what I can focus on. I know that that's not the bulk of everything you need. So. Um, Awesome. Nope. Thank and you. And I appreciate I will... that, but they, oh. they just have to um, be with your solution. <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, obviously we need to make sure that our reports are reporting to still answer the questions that you are asking and, um, you know, happy to, to put that on their radar. Thank you. Yeah. And, and to that point, obviously not an issue, something that's solvable right now, but, you know, if you are finding that you're having to have reporting built out of Cognos, that is purely financial data, that there's gaps in the Oracle reporting offerings, um, you know, putting in enhancement requests is going to be an important tool over the next couple of years as we get reporting stabilized, because we want to make sure that we're providing the right reporting for everybody to use. Um, and then, uh, Kirsten, there's an um, accounting ask question, a signage flip question. I'm not even going to pretend to answer it from Aaliyah. Uh, I might be pronouncing that wrong. I'm so sorry. In the chat, GL dash VE balance always means surplus. Um, I'm not even sure what those, I don't, not even sure what a negative VE is. So. Yeah, Aaliyah, can you expand on that? And what you mean by that question? Yeah, hi, sorry. Um, my question was, I know in the past, when we see negative balances in the GL reports, those that was actually the surplus and not um, deficit, but um, I'm hearing it's different now. Has that changed or was I not understanding it correctly in the beginning? So I, I think, and this is probably where um, the question or this feedback was coming from about referencing the signage. Um, I think it depends on the report. Um, so revenues and equity and liabilities naturally have credit balances, which are naturally negatives. Assets and revenue, or sorry, expenses and revenue naturally have a debit balance, which is naturally a positive. Um, to the extent that we can, we do try to flip signs to make reading those reports more easy. Um, but there are going to be scenarios where, um, especially if you're presenting all of the accounts, um, you do often you do often have to leave the balances in their natural state, um, and that 
then becomes having to remember that, okay, a credit to equity is actually, or a credit to revenue even, is actually a positive. Um, So are you are you talking natural balance indicators, natural balance to the quote allocation or budget fund side versus the expense? Is that is that kind of what we can go to? Because that's what Finlink did. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a function of of the report. And like Kathy mentioned, um, you know, for the NOR and a lot of the reports, we've tried to make a point to flip the signs. Um, so I think it just really comes down to understanding the data that you're looking at. Um, I, we can certainly take a note back to reference any signage changes where possible. Um, I think that would be a good idea. There's a lot of transition of personnel yeah. coming in mm -hmm. and, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry with having a note. So I think it's a good idea from Lowe's, Lowe's uh, point. Yeah, we can, we can take that back to the larger um, group and discuss when it makes sense to do that. Yeah, and I think what I'm taking in from this is augmenting some of the report training with what the signage, when, where, and how, and why for the signage, right? In terms of really clarifying that out and just creating, right, uh, since creating some help there. Since it's yeah. not consistent, it's better to be safe than sorry. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and Luke, you're right. The general ledger panorama does not have the sign flip. Um, and that's because if you were to run a fund on the general ledger panorama and you subtotal the entire, all of the balances, it would net to zero because that's essentially running a trial balance on a fund. Yeah, and Kimberly, I think your example is the same um, as what Luke was referencing. Yeah, we were like ships passing in cyberspace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But I do want to note that um, the general ledger balance report in the project panorama shows the debits as negative and credits as positive, but they're not really debits and credits. They're just showing the balances. It, it's confusing because in that, in that same panorama, the general ledger balances report shows if you, if you have resources it's positive. If you don't, it's negative. But then the general ledger transaction detail report has the debits as positive and the credits as negative, like they should be in the accounting world. Yeah. And, and like Luke said in the chat, you have to make sure you understand which report you're looking at. Um, but we can certainly try to do what we can to help people because there is so much turnover. Um, Thank you for answering dumb questions about like, is a negative good or is a negative bad in this situation? Of course, of course. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I, answer, I ask her those every day. I'm like, flip the sign, don't flip the sign. I don't know what's happening. So, <laughs> and, and we'll have our Dean's office looking at it and they're going, what, what, what do you mean? No, we, you have to add this. No, you have to subtract it. The signs are confusing. So yeah. anyway, and any other notations that are loud and clear? are always helpful. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, well, we're down to our last five minutes. Kirsten, thank you so much for being on this call. Um, thanks to all of you for joining. Um, this is, we know that this is mission critical. Um, we know that there's gonna be a lot of movement that has to happen over the next seven days. Um, we, we are, we also know that we're not going to be perfect on July 1, but we are dedicated to getting you through and figuring out the best way to align to what we need to have delivered for you to support you from July 1st through October. And then obviously um, moving into next fiscal year and the next fiscal year, right? As this continues to, um, to play out uh, for the movement of money in and out of projects and FIN units. Um, please, please, please send me via Teams or via email the reports that you use. Um, 
flood my email box. It's fine. I would rather have the same report 25 times than miss it. And we're going to do everything we can to have some great examples for you next Wednesday. So please come back next week, same time, same place, same link. So bookmark the link that you use today. Um, the recording of this, I saw that question several times come through the chat. Um, this recording will be posted to the Blink page for our office hours. And Eva, you're like my go-to link person on this particular page because I can never find it. Um, do, if you still have that handy, would you please throw that into the chat? Because as soon as I get the recording, it takes about an hour for it to come through. I send it off to Laura and the OCM team for the project, and they post it to that blank page. So if you need to share it, if you need to have your bosses look at it, if you need to um, re-look at this a thousand times until the signage flips start to click in, whatever you need, right? That'll be there for you for reference. Um, thank you so much, Eva. Um, Charlie, is there, yeah. That's the office hours page, but I don't know. I, is the Where are the recordings? Um, record, it should screen. be under the recorded webinar section. Oh, it got posted in the chat. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, it should be right under kind of the subject of the office hour. There should be like a link trait like to the um, content, to the video content. Um, before we cut off, there was a question sent to me directly that I want to address for the larger group. Absolutely. Um, so when we talk about the GL resetting the revenue and expense to zero on seven one. What happens is when Oracle, when July is opened in Oracle, it will automatically for the July ledger show revenue and expenses zero. As entries continue to happen into June, the equity balance at the fund and entity level will continue to update until we final close June. Um, so there, there shouldn't be a problem with that. Um, so I think the question was, if, if you're trying to zero out a, proje a GL project balance after June payroll hits, um, would it be best to pull the GL project balances on 630? I think you're best to wait until you're done, until J June is done moving to look at June 30 balances. Um, anything that happens in Oracle in July will update automatically. It's, Oracle just works its magic in the back end and takes care of those things. Do we have a date on when we think July is going to close? Is that, has that been posted? When June is going to close? Or, I'm sorry, yes, when June is going to close? Um, so I, it has been posted. There's a fiscal, um, a fiscal year and closing schedule. Um, I know that there's a cutoff for when departments and VC areas can post data. And then there's some time that the accounting offices have activity to post. Okay. I, all of that stops around mid-August, um, but I but the cutoff for um, transactional activity is much earlier than that. Okay, so, so that financial. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find the link real quick. The the fiscal closing. Um, thank you, Jillian. Seven twenty three. It's trying to go off of memory and keep it separate from what the foundation's timelines are. Um, so 723. Awesome. Um, thank you all for being here. Fantastic questions. Uh, we will see you back here next week. We'll have some demos. We'll take more questions. I'll make sure if Kirsten can't join, Melissa can join. We'll have somebody. We'll have a, G a GL slash accounting expert on the line. We'll have Kathy and team from the CBO side. We just want to make sure you get all your questions answered as we start moving to uh Fiscal year 22, it's so exciting. All right, have a fantastic um, extra long weekend this weekend and we will see you guys next week.